And welcome to your lunchtime news right here on TV1. For the News First team, I'm Shehan Manatunga. Let's first take a look at your headlines. Government plans to introduce a new police ordinance. Cabinet green light to increase youth representation at local government bodies. Embassy officials linked to sex trafficking will be arrested, assures Minister. NASA's Orion capsule arrives at moon, just before lunar orbit. Death toll in Indonesia quake rises. Sri Lanka's Minister of Labour and Foreign Employment Manu Shananyakar in Parliament informed today that the law will be strictly enforced against those involved in trafficking women to Oman where they are auctioned and sold to the highest bidder. Minister Manu Shananyakara revealed to the parliament that as per the data available with the Sri Lanka Foreign Employment Bureau, there are 12 Sri Lankan women at the safe house in Oman operated by the Sri Lanka Embassy who had registered themselves with the SLFEB and another 65 who had used visit visa to travel to Oman citing other reasons to Sri Lankan authorities. He added that 70 Sri Lankan women registered with the Sri Lanka Foreign Employment Bureau and 7 Sri Lankan women who have used visit visa are currently held in Dubai. The the minister went on to note that Sri Lankans who registered with the Sri Lanka Foreign Employment Bureau and faced issues overseas can be brought back to the country without any issue. However, there is growing concern over the rise in numbers using visit visa for employment purposes. He added that legal action was instituted on over 100 incidents of abuse and multiple suspects were arrested based on the investigations. He revealed to the House that only 40 Sri Lankan Foreign Employment Bureau personnel are assigned to meet the needs of all countries. However, Cabinet has granted approval to recruit another 50 personnel. Minister Manushanana Kara said an individual at the Sri Lanka Embassy in Oman who is accused of committing sexual abuse towards Sri Lankan women has been interdicted and will be brought back to the country where he will be arrested on arrival and will be investigated. The Sri Lankan Bureau of Foreign Employment has decided to temporarily suspend the self-registration of Sri Lankan women who are travelling to Oman and UAE to work as domestic aides and other unskilled jobs. However, this will not apply to Sri Lankan women who possess work permits and heading back for employment after returning to the country. In other news, the vote on the second reading of the 2023 budget will take place on Tuesday evening. The debate on the second reading of the appropriation bill began on November 15th and the voting for the second reading will be held on November 22nd at 5 p.m. Subsequently, the debate on the committee stage of the appropriation bill is scheduled to be held from November 23rd to December 8th and the voting will be held on December 8th at 7 p.m. Minister Mahinda Maravira said that all Sri Lanka Freedom Party MPs who are connected to the government have decided to vote in favour of the second reading of the budget today. Meanwhile, the Samagijana Balavege, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the People's Freedom Congress and the National People's Power have decided to vote against it. The Executive Committee member of the National People's Power, KD Lal Kanta, says it is paramount to dissolve parliament and elect a new government. A requirement has arisen to send these rulers home. That is the will of the people of this country as well. The National People's Power on a national scale has commenced in Aragalea to re-establish the public mandate, dissolve the parliament and establish a new government. Everyone says the tenure of parliament is five years, 100% inaccurate. By next year, 5th February, if President Ranil Vikramasinghe wishes, he can dissolve the parliament irrespective of whether the MPs agree or disagree. We are stressing on rulers to dissolve parliament. Now, Cabinet has granted approval to amend the local authorities' elections ordinance to increase youth representation in local government institutions. Now, the acting cabinet spokesperson Shanta Bandara told reporters that Colombo District MP Premanatsi Dolavatta presented a private member's bill on the matter to Parliament. Accordingly, the cabinet granted approval to the proposal made in this respect by the Minister of Youth and Sports, 
to amend the provisions. The Sri Lankan government is planning on introducing a Banking Special Provisions Act as the process to amend the existing Banking Act is a time-consuming matter. Justice Minister Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa speaking to reporters on Tuesday said that the general public was gravely inconvenienced due to fraudulent acts committed by licensed as well as unlicensed financial institutions in the country. He said the existing laws do not contain provisions to close down some of those financial institutions and therefore there is a need to include legal provisions for the dissolution of such institutions and provide funds to depositors. He said as amending the existing Banking Act would take time, it was proposed to introduce the Banking Special Provisions Act for urgent time-sensitive requirements and to solve those matters. Now, Sri Lanka's Cabinet of Ministers granted approval to the proposal to introduce a new police ordinance based on the new social norms and trends. According to a Cabinet Memorandum produced to the Minister of Public Security, the existing police ordinance number 16 of 1865 has been the subject to amendments of 37 or I should say on 37 instances. Pakistan and Sri Lanka have agreed to continue to support each other at all regional and international fora on the sidelines of the Armed Forces Defence Dialogue. The third round of Pakistan-Sri Lanka Armed Forces Defence Dialogue was held in Expo Centre Karachi from 16 to 17th of November 2022. Pakistan delegation was led by Lieutenant Retired General Hamoud Uz Zaman Khan and the Sri Lankan delegation was headed by the Secretary of Defence, retired General Kamal Gunaratna. During the dialogue, Pakistan and Sri Lanka reviewed the existing scope of bilateral military relations and expressed satisfaction on the progress achieved under the umbrella of AFDD. Both sides exchanged views on regional security and upcoming challenges. It was agreed that Pakistan and Sri Lanka will continue to support each other at all regional and international fora. The cooperation in the field of defence industry, military training, joint exercises, high-level visits will continue. A programme organised by the Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka on global entrepreneurship was held in Colombo yesterday. The event was held in light of the Global Entrepreneurship Week 2022. The event called Ignite SME, organized by the Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka in collaboration with Trace Expert City, was held with the aim of technology adaptation and power up the small and medium entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka. Officials of various government organizations participated in the event. The event focuses on arranging a series of workshops for the participants and train and monitor SMEs around Sri Lanka and gain export revenue. Monday, 43 months since the April attacks and activists continue their call for justice. Panalagiya, Janadipati, Gotabe Rajapaksa. As soon as Gotabe Rajapaksha assumed duties as president, he changed all investigation bodies. There are 128 cases at the Colombo Municipal Council, 182 in Nigambo and many more at the CID. The main case is the Colombo High Court, but everything is slow-paced. No justice has been served even after 43 months. 24 hours before 300 plus people were killed in this heinous crime, Gotabe Rajapaksha told the media he is the candidate. He said he will hold everyone accountable for it within a month. We have seen stories like that in movies where bombs are planted for people to come into politics. But we have experienced it in Sri Lanka. Why weren't the perpetrators of this attack exposed for 43 months till today? This file cannot be closed by leaving this behind, blaming the Muslim extremist youth who were killed. It is clear. We are asking who is the person who gave the contract. Hey. 
Dr. Harsha De Silva, the chairman of the Committee on Public Finance, told Parliament on Tuesday that there is a rollover risk on short-term domestic borrowings. So what we are saying is, because the inflation is so high, there is going to be a natural growth in your revenue. But to get the additional revenue beyond inflation uh, is a question given the falling growth rates that we are expecting. Against the backdrop of the economic crisis and high inflation, it may be difficult to maintain certain categories of non-interest recurring expenditures such as salaries and wages at the levels in 23. As interest payments are expected to rise considerably, primary on account of domestic borrowings, the committee is of the view that there is a rollover risk associated with short-term domestic borrowing given the current high yielding uh, rates on treasury bills. The main risk associated with the, for, with the foreign interest payment estimate is that it is heavily reliant on the progress of debt restructuring negotiations. Now, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa said the President, as the Finance Minister, has demonstrated the requirement of a new economy based on this new budget. He said that if one questions why we are in this situation and they are trying to reason out the incidents of the recent past and the truth will be buried, he alleged that the good governance government took large amounts of loans during a short period of time and certain individuals who are talking about improving the economy were part of that government. He said that when those individuals are asked to take the responsibility, they refuse. In the meantime, the leader of the National People's Power, Anukumar Adisanayaka, questioned the realistic nature of the budget presented by the government. Anukumar Disanayaka speaking in parliament said that the president had to agree that the economy set up in 1977 has failed and matters need to be looked into a completely different way. Disanayaka says, however, the budget does not seem to be different and the same content had been given flavor by the president. He said at a time when the income of the government is just over 1,000 billion rupees, how come the government is targeting thrice that amount? Now on to some news overseas. U.S. Space Agency NASA's Orion capsule reached the moon on Monday, whipping around the far side and buzzing the lunar surface on its way to a record-breaking orbit with test dummies sitting in for astronauts. It's the first time a capsule has visited the moon since NASA's Apollo program 50 years ago and represents a huge milestone in the 4.1 billion US dollar test flight that began last Wednesday. Orion is part of NASA's Artemis program which aims to put the first woman and first person of color on the moon in the next few years. Orion sat atop the space agency's most powerful rocket ever, the Space Launch System or SLS, as it blasted off from Florida in the US. Now, an earthquake on the main Indonesian island of Java has killed scores of people and injured hundreds on Monday. According to U.S. Geological Survey data, the 5.6 magnitude quake struck Kianju town in West Java at a shallow depth of 10 kilometers. The town of 175,000 people is located in a mountainous area of West Java, Indonesia's most densely populated province. Some of the dead were students at an Islamic boarding school, while others were killed in their own homes when roofs and walls fell in on them. Scores of people were taken to hospital, with many treated outside. Rescuers have worked through the night to try to save others thought to still be trapped under collapsed buildings. The area where the quake struck is densely populated and prone to landslides with poorly built houses reduced to rubble in many areas. The exact number of people killed so far remains unclear. However, Indonesia's National Disaster Mitigation Agency has said the official death toll was 62, adding that another figure given by regional governor Ridwan Kamil, 162 remains unverified. The tremor could also be felt in the capital Jakarta, about 100 kilometers away, where people were evacuated from high-rise buildings. 
Now elsewhere, a large earthquake has been reported near the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. A tsunami warning was issued for an area off the coast within 300 kilometers of the epicenter and the Prime Minister's office urged people to move to higher ground. The earthquake cut power to some areas of Hunara and the state broadcaster was also down but the government said there was no major damage to buildings in the capital. The United States Geological Service said the magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck the Malango region about 55 kilometers west of the capital at a depth of 15 kilometers. It revised the size of the tremor from an earlier magnitude of 7.3. Now in other news, Ukrainian authorities have begun evacuating civilians from recently liberated sections of the Kherson and Mykolaiv regions, fearing that a lack of heat, power and water due to Russian shelling will make conditions too unlivable this winter. Authorities urge residents of the two southern regions, which Russian forces have been shelling for months, to move to safer areas in the central and western parts of the country. Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister said that the government will provide transportation, accommodation and medical care for them, with priority given to women with children and the elderly. The evacuations are taking place more than a week after Ukraine recaptured the city of Kherson on the western bank of the Dnieper River and surrounding areas in a major battlefield gain. Since then, heading into the winter, residents and authorities alike are realizing just how much power and other infrastructure the Russians destroyed before retreating or had damaged just in the last week. Now, three exciting games of the FIFA World Cup 2022 are scheduled for this evening. And you can catch all the World Cup action right here, live and exclusive on TV1. With that, that's the news for this hour. Thank you for watching.